Why we are doing this, I think it's clear to everybody. And we have discussed it over the entire day. Um, we need innovation. It's difficult for both sometimes to do and develop everything themselves. I mean, it's not a postal issue, really. It's all large organizations have difficulties in, in being innovative, uh, developing new solutions. So reaching out to others that specialize in certain fields that can solve problems that we have is something that is uh, critical. And in particular, in one session in the morning when we had uh, many of the posts uh, here presenting how they are doing innovation, um, you can see most of the posts today have an approach, an innovation approach that includes startups. It's not just one uh, tiny element. For some of the posts, it's really a, a huge thing to integrate the startups in their business, develop solutions together, roll them out, and many, many new solutions, many new innovations come simply from there. And that's why it's so important. And that's why John and myself, we decided last year, this is something where we simply must do a little bit more. We must bring the posts, the logistics companies, together with those startups, identify new startups, find out what's going in, on in, 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 in the terms of innovation, new developments uh, in this wider sector, and then link them up with the posts. So I think uh, this is something that everybody agrees on, which is important. And um, let me also say a few things here about the format, because again, this is the same thing as we did it in Geneva. Uh, the format is very strict, actually. We have five minutes pitching and five minutes Q&A for each startup. Might seem short, uh, but if you cannot really uh, deliver the main message or convince judges within five minutes what your main product is and what you're doing and how it can be of value for the postal and logistics sector, uh, then you can't do it in one hour either. So we said five minutes, that's really good. In five minutes, you can really present what makes you unique, what can you contribute to the postal and logistics sector, what makes you so valuable. And then five minutes are extended because they're the five minutes of Q&A. I briefed the, judge, uh, the, 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 the startups about this rule, and it's very strict. So the 10 minutes maximum cannot be extended. After 10 minutes, really, you have to leave the stage. But if not, if you don't, really use force. Uh, I need help in that case, please. Um, so if you extend a little bit, for example, to six minutes or whatever for your pitch, we'll deduct it from the rest of the time that you have. So we urge you not to do it because the Q&A part is very important, and it's not only Q&A. And that's how we briefed our judges. It's not only that they can ask questions. They can also make comments or recommendations, and I think that's also important for you, this kind of exchange. They can ask you some things or make comments in respect to your services, to your solutions that are relevant for them. And I'll very soon present to you the judges and you see why they can give you very, very valuable input. Um, let me briefly, briefly read out to you the, what criteria that we have defined. There are three criteria uh, that, uh, that the judges will use as a basis for evaluating and rating uh, the different startups. The first one is innovation. The innovation is a new and innovative idea offering an exciting new product or solution. It has identified new so far unmet customer needs and is able to address those needs. That's one. The second one is value. The innovation has a unique value proposition and differentiates itself from other products or solutions. It has a good cost benefit ratio and provides a robust business model and market entry strategy. It has a significant value proposition. And the third one is impact. It has the capability to change the market or part of the market or can even create a new market. The innovation has the capability to impact the way things are done within its area of application in the future. It can be a game changer. It will have an impact on the industry, the environment, and society. So these are the three criteria that we have. Of course, they are quite uh, sophisticated, if you want. They they high demands behind them. But again, they are just a criteria on which to base uh, the rating on. Um, let me now introduce to you quickly the judges that we have. We have six judges here. And uh, you'll see those are all experts uh, in, in the postal sector. They know what innovation means. They know what cooperation with startup means. Um, and they can, as I said before, ask really the right questions or make those comments that are valuable for you to define also your solutions. We have Olaf Klagart. You have already heard from him. He was in a morning session from Geopost uh, La Post. We have Colleen uh, from uh, Postanel Innovation Studio. We have Farzin. He is uh, from Plug and Play in California. Uh, we have Gary Reblin of USPS, responsible for innovation. 
we have Elmar Toime, and uh, we have Thierry, who was also on the panel this morning from Swiss Post. So we have really a mix of people from the post directly, so they know if they go back to their respective divisions within their companies and say, listen, there was a startup with this and that solution, they know what those divisions will ask them, where you bring us those startups, those ideas, but did you consider that, or how did they think about these and that criteria? So they know what they're talking about. I just want to underline it to show you that those charges that will rate, uh, they rate with a perspective of innovation, but they rate also with this per a perspective of how can it benefit my organization if potentially we will work together with them. And this is, I think, important. Uh, we will call the startups up one after the other, and uh, as I said, they will have 10 minutes. The order will be Sixer Global, Slimbox, Upsell Direct, Postec, Odin, Udelf. Uh, the next one is uh, on your list that you probably have seen far eye. They couldn't make it, unfortunately. Then Motogo and Package AI. So this is the order, and I would say we get started right away uh, with Sixer Global, L. You're already here. Good afternoon. I'm Al Gary, and I'm the CEO and founder of Zigzag Global. Zigzag is a software service a platform to help retailers, couriers, and 3PLs manage domestic returns and international returns worldwide. We provide a network of virtual warehouses so that your customers can get faster refunds and that retailers can get products back on sale more, more quickly and cost effectively. Returns are now so important that over three quarters of buyers check the returns policy before they make a purchase, meaning that returns are now more important than price. Around a third of shoppers are now buying with the intention of returning products, many often doing so simply just to get free shipping on the original order. Free shipping is now such a big thing and free returns are such a big thing that more than half of retailers offer them. But of course, there's no such thing as a free return. The Zigzag Returns Portal offers consumers a simple way to return a product in less than one minute. Retailers can control the cost of returns with dynamic rules to offer free returns and take payment if required based on the, the value or reason for return. A retailer branded portal is accessed from the returns page of a retailer's website or, or from a confirmation email or a digital receipt and we offer customers a simple way to return a product uh, with over 35 languages available. The customer sees a copy of their order and selects a reason for return or exchange, and we simplify and localize the returns process. We offer free or paid returns, and using a local returns address means that we can reduce the cost of a return uh, in over 200 local warehouses. Buyers can choose by, between convenient carrier options, such as post office or collection from home, uh, to a, lo a local returns address in over 130 countries. And we currently support over 300,000 drop-off points on our network and collection from millions of home addresses. We use predictive analytics to understand where the product will sell next, which determines the route of the parcel, which might be back to a warehouse or possibly even to a store that needs to stock without touching the warehouse in between. Labels are generated and paperless options are also supported with full tracking and consumers can choose to receive text messages with tracking updates which has created a 40% drop in customer service inquiries. We give retailers full visibility of the returns wherever they are in the world in real time. We have state of the art re reporting functionality to make simple and meaningful reports at a product level or order level and we can get a global view or drill down to see country level detail to understand where the, cu the customers are returning from. Instant reports can show you where the spikes in traffic are coming from. So you can see this ret retailer had a massive uh, returns day on the 27th of December and uh, again on the 4th of January. We provide intelligent data to help retailers understand why products are being returned and spot trends before they become an issue. Uh, this particular example, the second bar, you can't see that, but it's actually uh, because parcels were damaged on arrival. So that retailer was able to change their packaging and swap out the courier. When the products arrive back in a zigzag warehouse, zigzag can scan, grade and refurbish products to get them back in, in the supply chain more quickly. 
the original consumer can then be automatically refunded in just 24 hours and goods can then be refulfilled to a new order for the same product, meaning we can sell via, via one of 26 marketplaces globally. So the product doesn't have to go back from the, the UK back to Australia and then back to the UK again. It can stay in Australia and be resold in that local market. We can also help the retailer to gather uh, data to reclaim duty and taxes if they're consolidating and, and partner <coughs> with people like Hurricane to, to do the duty reclaim, for instance. Our largest retail clients include Arcadia, uh, so that's top man, the top shop, and so on, uh, Selfridges, and we white label our software to lead, leading global couriers, including DHL, who resell the platform to their clients. We've cut the cost of top shop returns by 57%. And customers are now being refunded five times faster. Integration can take as little as one hour. I've got 20 years experience in retail and logistics and I've, I've founded this company because I really understand the pain that a retailer feels and I understand the logistics industry and what's required to keep the consumer happy. ZigZag won the start of, of the year at Shop Talk and we've got great traction from major brands and retailers and last month we were named in the, the Retail Tech Top 50 and won the best e-commerce enabler uh, award at Millennial 2020 in London. We de deliver innovation, value and impact to the logistics market and we are truly disrupting the global supply chain. We are ZigZag Global and we'd like to wish you many happy returns. So the floor is open to the judges. You have a mic there or you, a couple of them as I can see. Who wants to start? Yeah. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. It's a very clear presentation and congratulations for, for your company. Uh, it's a very good idea and I, I like many things on, on your model. I have one question only is, is about scalability in your assets because I understand you're managing your own warehouse locally. So we work with partner warehouses. So the 200 warehouses on our platform don't belong to us. We don't pretend they do. And we're not a carrier either. So we don't need to own the warehouse and we don't need to, to be the carrier. So we, we, we actually plug into DPD Group, we plug into PostNL, we plug into uh, 60 carriers on the platform to move the parcels around, and we plug into large groups of 3PL networks who manage uh, retail 3PL um, performance every day. So, so they're used to receiving and, and scanning items, and, and they can assess the, the grade of products as well. So, so we don't need to own those warehouses. Okay, it's not your people that manage the uh, the analysis of the content, or no? We, so we are. Um, we don't even need to own, own the postal accounts. So if, if, if we're working with a, a postal provider, for instance, they can resell the platform to their own, um, their own retailers on their own rate card. Uh, and we are, uh, over, we are the overview of what's happening in all of those warehouses. So it's a single view of stock anywhere in the world and returns anywhere where they happen. But as this moves forward, it won't just be about returns. It will be about, uh, for instance, that, that local stock that Brody was talking about earlier this morning. It's a really a follow-on from that. You're relying on partner warehouses. In some of those, you will be a very, very minor partner in that warehouse. So it's really the competence with which they deal with the product that your system is putting into them. What has been your experience with the competence of your partner warehouses to do what you expect them to do? So we only tend to work with very large 3PL groups who do this day in, day out. For, for a living and they're measured by the platform on their own performance. So if we've got one warehouse that's receiving goods slowly or grading things uh, incorrectly, then we're tracking that performance. We're tracking it down to the user level so we know the, the very individual that, that made that mistake. Uh, we also know that the, the retailers uh, that we're working what with... What has been your experience from what you know? So, what yeah, so the experience has actually been very positive um, and really positive reception from the, the 3PLs. Um, 3PLs are interested because it creates traffic for them. And, and they, they want to help us, they want to work with us. And the same with the post and, and the, uh, the courier industry as well. Actually, I've got another follow-on question, which is, uh, what's your strategy to find out and select the, the warehouses and the drop-off points? I've, I've seen more than 250, 300 warehouses in the last three years. Um, I, I visit them, or, or my team visits them personally. Mm -hmm. Uh, we work with groups like Wing Canton in the UK who already managed retail for about half the high street in, in Britain. We work with people like APL Logistics, um, you know, various big large 3PL groups who are competent in this already. I have 
two quick questions. One is, what's your footprint in the United States? And secondarily, uh, what's your model as far as pricing? Do you offer a complete solution where they'll just pay one price and you'll manage the 3PL warehousing and all the aggregate cost for them? Or obviously the resell, the merchant, would, the, the post would do it, but in the case where you're dealing with the, the merchant or the returner. Yeah, so, so we can offer both, um, either the, the full package where we just supply one price and everything's included, or you can use your own postal contract, even your own warehouse contract and just our platform to move the goods around. Um, it, it's really a, a bespoke solution by retailer. Uh, the footprint in the US, uh, at the moment we've got about 40 warehouses on the network. We're not using all 40 uh, because th there isn't enough traffic for that, but we're, we've got a very large warehouse on the East Coast, another one on the West Coast. Uh, we're already working uh, with USPS, with, with uh, FedEx, with DHL, um, and various other couriers to, to move parcels around. Uh, we've got uh, a trial starting later this year with Walmart uh, to help US retailers selling into Mexico get their goods back. You're making money? Yes. Uh, we're not profitable yet. I don't pretend we are. We're a startup, but uh, we're, we're revenue generating and we're, we're handling thousands of returns a day. Thousands, Th thousands of returns a day, yeah. yeah. Perfect. So one last question, sorry about the business model, because I assume that you, so if I understand you correctly, you take a, f a fee per uh, transaction that goes over the platform. We do. And then you have a couple of postal services or courier couriers that have white labeled your solution. And how do they make money? So they resell it to their clients because some of them maybe want, they want to be the carrier in the local market where they're strong. So DHL may want, we want to be the carrier in Germany, but it may not want to be the carrier in Australia, for instance. So we would provide a solution for them in Australia to still offer their clients so that they've got the end-to-end -end solution. Right. Further Thanks. questions during the reception. Yeah. Thank you very much, El. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> so next startup, please. We have Philip from Belgium who will present to us Slimbox. Don't stop the time yet. <laughs> Just wait, he's not. Yeah, so. Okay, perfect. Can now you can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So hands up, who uh, buys stuff online? Yeah, well, I think if you're not, you're in the wrong room, right? Isn't e-commerce just one of the best inventions ever? Only a few weeks ago, I was sitting on my couch in my pajamas, 2 a.m. in the morning, ordering the newest iPhone online. And just th the very next day, the courier already rang my bell. And so I opened the, the door, and he's standing in front of me with this gigantic box. So I start to stress out. I mean, was I drunk when I ordered my phone? Did I maybe press the order button five times? Can, can my vis uh, Visa card even take that amount of uh, money? What's happening? Is this mine? So w with some hesitation, I, I, I take that box, and now I'm completely stressed out. I mean, this doesn't weigh like there's five phones in it. W what is this? Is this mine? So I slam the door shut, and I, I cut the box open. Actually, maybe, maybe you should know, um, I, I order so many things online that I actually have a knife at my door. <laughs> o officially, it's to open the boxes once in a while. It's just for my protection. But anyway. so. I look inside the box and I see cushions, all plastic cushions. So I pull out this string of cushions, the, the length of my body, and there it finally is, that, that beautiful box with my phone in, all bumped and scratched because, well, they didn't put enough of these cushions inside. But hey, the, the phones are right, I've been cherishing it, I love it, uh, uh, it's, it's going very well, well up, up until recently when when my cat came along, it went wham on the hard floor. I mean the, the phone, not, not the cat, obviously. So, so I, I pick it up and, it, and the screen's broken. And this thing had become a part of myself. This is, I, I had to have it repaired as soon as possible. And so what I did was I ran off to, to the nearest drop-off point. Uh, I, I, I looked in their shop to, to find a box that would actually fit my phone. I couldn't really find something, so, so I, I picked a, a number, waited in line for like half an hour, only to, to hear that they, well, they didn't have any th anything else. They, they, they didn't have any filler materials. All the boxes were too big. So I got all frustrated. I went back home, and I had to fabricate something myself. But because that drop-off point didn't help me, 
I went somewhere else. Today, ladies and gentlemen, it's all about the customer journey. And um, this is something that you can make even better yourself because by sheer coincidence, of course, we happen to have the very best solution to that. And I would like to present you, is this the clicker? Yes, yeah. I would like to present you to Slimbox, a machine that cuts perfectly fitted packaging out of flat sheets of corrugated cardboard. Slimbox gives you the ability to, at any given moment, have any kind of box with any kind of dimension at hand, with less hassle, more affordable, and even more beautiful than anything, any other solution out there. Thanks to Slimbox, your customer can come into a drop-off point and make their own box and, and supports if they want. But it's also a solution that can be implemented in very, very large organizations that have a complete supply chain where everything is automated or at a, a distribution center where at every workstation you can put a machine like that so that the box is uh, finished by the time that the, the, the picking is done. Here's maybe something interesting. Did you know that of, of all the parcels that are sent around the world, 40% of it actually, on average at least, 40% of it actually is, is air and filler material? Why would I, as a customer, want to pay for that? I mean, that's, that's completely ridiculous. In, in Belgium, where I come from, um, if I go to a grocery store, I can't get a plastic bag, but when I order these same goods online, I get enough for 10 of these plastic bags. So if, if you want to become more competitive as an organization, here's how. Start to reduce your own costs, start to reduce your customers' costs, make them more happy, and become even more green, all at the same time, and all thanks to Slimbox. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. To so run again. First, uh, from uh, a carrier uh, recognize the issue because we pay for cube. So obviously uh, we can reduce our cost through a solution like that. Flying air isn't good for anyone. So, but from that standpoint is you talked about office and customer, how is it and can it be put into a warehouse environment for a mass production type solution? Well, it's not a machine that is going to do uh, mass production, so there are solutions to that, of course. Um, this is a machine that goes a lot slower uh, than that, but thanks to uh, simple software integration, simple uh, thanks to software integration, we can have the box ready by the time that the picking is actually done. So it, it can uh, com become something completely automated. Um, we're actually, because this is a, a good-looking machine, let's say, uh, this is something that, that belongs in a, in a postal office or in an office environment, um, if you put it in a, in a distribution center, it doesn't need to look and will not look like that. So we were making something more uh, static, like, let's but say. But how long did it take to make one box? Yes. Uh, it's about a minute, okay. yeah, uh, right now, and we're uh, even upping the speed, but that's uh, technical. Okay. You mentioned putting it in a post office, so is it feasible to go in, somehow dimension your box, have it made? What, what would be the cost of the box for me as a consumer? Well, uh, actually, that depends on the on the postal office or, or the, or the, the drop-off point uh, at that point. So, so we don't sorry we, we don't decide on the prices. Now, uh, just to give you an idea, the cost of actually making a box, um, if by standard it, uh, you um, arrive at only a fourth, fourth or a fifth of what the original box would actually cost. So, simply on material, um, because in in, uh, in Europe, for instance, we we have. Um, we don't have a lot of uh, dimensional weight uh, problems there, but we can get a return on investment on the machine in less than two years simply because of the, the corrugated. Instead, instead of buying boxes, you buy sheets, and there we get uh, our return on investment already. Yeah, I recognize the, the need for a better packaging, green packaging, but what's the USP of this machine? Do you have some IP on the machine? 
Yes, absolutely. So it's the technique actually that is used inside. Uh, thanks to the te technology, it's, it's using laser. We can not only make any kind of model, we can also make, uh, put, put uh, logos in, text in, uh, you name it. So, so we can create anything that you can make by hand. So we promote it as being a box making machine, but actually if you want to make, uh, I don't know, Christmas trees that you put in, uh, inside each other to, to, uh, during Christmas, that's, that's possible as well. Following on, there are several box making machines around in the marketplace. Yeah. They've been around for several years yeah. now. Uh, why is yours different? Is it just another competitor there? Uh, no, well, none of them are focusing on the ease of use. That's one of them. Uh, actually, I can go to uh, this one. So it's very small and practical. It's a very, very small machine. It's, it's maybe two, two times this, this piece here. Um, it's very easy in use, so you can use a smartphone, web browser, do it automatically. It's very low in maintenance, uh, so we don't have knives inside, so not every month uh, somebody has to come by and, and these kind of things. Um, and we can, we can do personalization like logos, like, like text, like whatever you want to put in there. And of course, there's a, an incredible return on investment because um, the other solutions, and I'm, I'm not seeing them as, as competitors, but the other solutions are too expensive for SMEs at least. Yeah, the retail price for that? Yes, it's, it's 25,000 euros. I think you just answered my question. So your revenue model is to sell the machine as opposed to selling the service, or well, uh, actually, are you a razor company, a razor blade company? Uh, well, no, actually, uh, the, the thing is, uh, we're a startup, so we're pivoting constantly. Um, what we've noticed is that uh, we got a lot of feedback from our customers that they wanted extras and extras and extras, <coughs> and so uh, we've seen that uh, there's a, a huge uh, potential for us to uh, start focusing more on software as a service and set up a complete platform where um, we would actually move from, uh, we give you the ability to make your own boxes towards the, the thing as um, you can have any kind of box at any given moment. And so even if you don't have the hardware, you can go online, order your, your box online, and by the time that you're, uh, you arrive in the post office or whatsoever, you have your box or a courier comes by with that box in his hands for you. So that's, that's a possibility. How many of these do you have deployed now? Uh, we're uh, working on the uh, next 20 batches, so there's ten, uh, ten uh, all in, s in six countries, and the next uh, 20 uh, batches, the next 20 machines, uh, I mean, uh, are being uh, yeah, sold and, and uh, placed in the inside, uh, in, in, in the market, in Europe. The 10 have been operational for how long? Uh, for, um, since September, October, yeah, September, October. And what kind of customer do you, do you have? What kind of well, use, use case? Um, of course, e-commerce uh, or box making uh, companies, um, uh, shops like a little bit like Staples, but then um, Paardenkoper. Uh, <laughs> so um, in, in the Netherlands, for instance. So uh, it's, it's uh, uh, quite diverse. People that, that uh, produce parts that are constantly different. Uh, for instance, here in, in the States, uh, I've been talking to somebody, he gave me a, a perfect list of, of any box that they had uh, bought in the last year, and uh, they were um, at a cost of $41,000, uh, and, and we could, simply by using the machine, no, no changes, um, we could reduce that to $8,900. Uh, so the machine would be included even uh, within a year, uh, they would have a return on investment. I'm only talking about corrugated, not even of uh, dimensional weight or, or things like that. Okay, no. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
I'm also the president of DigiPrint IP, an LLC that licenses patented technologies and disruptive business methods in the area of NFC certified mail, NFC delivery tracking, and direct mail advertising. The green one, I guess. Ah, got it. Okay. We are here seeking solutions to challenges facing our ecosystem. How to confront rapid innovations and technology advances. How to entice the consumer to open the envelope for the direct mail industry. And how to ca capitalize on the pleasant unboxing micro moment and promote add-on purchases. Introducing go for a tag by Upsell Direct. Upsell Direct is a revolutionary startup company offering a disruptive and innovative upselling system using near-field communication tags to launch a personalized and customized opportunity directly to the consumer for upselling related products, services, and advertising. When the consumer receives the package, they tap on the go for a tag, instantly connecting them to view and order targeted upsell and cross-sell products and to access valuable assembly and use instructions. The go for a tag extends the product's life cycle and the initial sales encounter after the product has been shipped and received. The tag can be branded with the logo of any merchant. The go for it tags are encoded and shipped to the consumer. So here is your package. The tag can be placed on the carton, on an insert inside the package, or even on the product itself. The consumer then taps the tag and is connected to the retailer's database to receive the targeted information. So here's our value proposition. It's like putting a salesperson in the box with a product, creating micro moments to the consumers and upselling opportunities for the retailer, manufacturer, or service provider. Establishing a new digital touch point with consumers the instant they receive a product. Informing and upselling without being there. Personalizing, customizing, and tailoring marketing messages. Driving traffic to websites and to the brick and mortar stores. Growing revenue, generating new sources of income, and increasing profit margins. And creating deeper consumer loyalty. We are unique. Our go for it tags are inexpensive, easily incorporated into the assembly or shipping line process and scannable by over 95% of mobile devices and can be individually customized to the recipient. Our go for it tags can be re-encoded offering complex consumer manufacturer retailer interaction. Here's a one minute quick video. The world of retail sales is changing. Introducing Go For It Tags by Upsell Direct. Go For It Tags uses near field communication tags, or NFC for short, that, unlike QR codes, can be encoded with individualized rich product information, including a URL. Go For It Tags can be used four ways placed on the package, in an insert inside the package, on a Go For It card inside the package or better yet, on the product itself. The product and go for it tags are then shipped to the customer. When the customer gets their package, they are directed to scan the NFC tag with their smartphone. The tag data, encoded by the retailer with a unique code, then transmits back to the retailer's website, which then processes that code. Using the retailer's database, the customer is then offered potential customized and personalized upsell items that relate to their original purchase. The customer can get additional information about the product or any number of digital prompts that the retailer may wish to send, such as coupons or sales information. Protected by their intellectual properties, GoForIt tags can significantly increase sales for the retailers that use them. So. To summarize, okay. Sorry. OK. 
everything. So to summarize, GoFor tags are a revolutionary and innovative way to use shipments to substantially increase sales. GoFor tags combine the power of the mobile device with the mail parcel moment, and also it converges the printed text with the digital world. Now you can compete in our technologically sophisticated consumer marketplace. Finally, a presentation here at Postal Vision would not be complete without handing out a, an envelope. So judges, I have here for you a sample of the envelope of the food chef with tags on the outside and on the inside, as well as a flyer uh, that when you scan that tag, takes you to a landing page that shows you all the potential things that you can do with a, an NFC tag to communicate with, uh, with the customer. So in each envelope, you will find $500. <laughs> okay, shoot, questions, please call in. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Avery. I think it's a um, great way of, um, we're, we're always looking for ways to make receiving a parcel even more of a special and happy moment, because it's kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> one of our few ways to make uh, people very happy. Um, However, and if I look at Dutch people, we are a little um, hesitant if it comes down to marketing. We're not, we don't really like to be the product of a marketing uh, campaign that much. Uh, so I was wondering if the NFC technology could be a solution for, uh, for example, the returns uh, uh, process. Well, so the, 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 the beauty of the fact that you're using an NFC tag, the NFC tag can be bundled to have various applications on it, whether it's return or whether it's security or whether it's upselling, but the focus of our intellectual property is based on, on upselling. But, but like I said, because it's a, it's a tag, there's a lot that you can do, do with the technology. So you said that the tag will increase sales. Do, yes. you do you have some uh, figures or conversion metrics on that? Sure. Based upon our marketing research, uh, we show that over 53% of respondents favor the use of a go for it tag, and that over 75% of those will scan the tag. This is equivalent to an overall 40% scan rate. We feel we can double the QR code 6% conversion rate and achieve a 10 to 15% conversion rate and maybe even higher. How do you see the difference between obviously the Android platform where you literally can just tap if your NFC's on as opposed to the Apple where you have to download an app, turn on the NFC, a lot more difficult experience, although finally they made it eligible. Uh, what are you seeing or expecting uh, in difference in response rate between the two platforms and do you see it as being potentially equally as effective on the iOS platform as you do on the Android platform? I mean, that's a, that's a very fair point. You do have to download an app uh, if, you, if you have an iPhone 7 or up. But uh, we're, we're thinking about trying to come up with a solution that bypasses that. I don't have an answer yet, but we are, we are working on that. Uh, and obviously, with, uh, with any other type of phone, as you, as you just well stated, you just turn the NFC on and, you know, very quickly you're there. Thank you. I, I know you're referring to it as upsell, but it occurred to me it's an ideal platform for sending back feedback, either about the whole process, the product, or whatever. So I wonder whether that's on the cards. Um, and secondly, does this? In, you talked about personalization. I have bought this, whoever I am. How much effort is required on the retailer to now land me on a page that really is relevant to me, as opposed to just another generic page? Uh, well, it, it's sort of up to the retailer what they want to do with the tag. The, the, your, your, your first point that you raised, uh, the, the tag can be used to cover services or to cover advertisement. So any type of uh, relationship that the manufacturer or the retailer want to have, whether it's filling out a warranty form or whether it's showing, like, for example, uh, in, in that uh, handout that I gave you, uh, they bought a, a bowl and then they, they're offering a mixer and they're showing you recipes that you can uh, add to your product as well as, uh, you know, possibly 
uh, instructional video of how to clean the mixer or how to assemble it. So from a service and advertisement point of view, that's, that's all there. And I'm sorry, your second question was? Uh, uh, well, just for the effort they had to make it personalizable. Yeah, well, uh, right, right. It, it, it depends on what you want to do with the landing page. You know, the, the w wide array is varied. And one of the advantages also here is, is now when you're shopping online on a computer, a lot of times they ask you to chat. Well, here, because you're on your phone, they can also, if they want to, ask you to video chat, which is something that's, that's, uh, that's non-existent. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Time is over. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Don't forget your parcel. <laughs> okay, next ones. The guys from Postec. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. From the UK, please. Hey there. I want to introduce you to PostTag by telling you a story of how we created PostTag or why we created PostTag. Four years ago, I moved my family, my dogs, and my furniture back from Australia to the UK, to this beautiful, beautiful home in the English countryside, and everyone was really looking forward to getting there. The family made it, the dogs made it, I made it, the furniture didn't. The furniture is still in the high seas somewhere, in a container floating two feet below the surface. So. We became, in a very short space of time, Amazon, Amazon's biggest customer. We were having 12 to 15 parcels a day delivered to our home. And it was, it was a big problem to us because where we lived, you've seen that beautiful house, the postcode, and in the UK we have a very, very sophisticated postcode system, as you know, the postcode takes you here, which is nowhere near where we live. So Tom. Google Maps, Tom, Tom and Garmin will take you there. Where we actually live is the other side of the lake, which is one kilometre away. You cannot see the house from where the postcode is, is, is telling you we're meant to be. So that presented a very, very big problem because we're sitting in this idyllic, beautiful house and we were just being held hostage. So day in, day out, hour in, hour out, we were being held hostage. We felt like we were being held to ransom by the parcels that weren't arriving. And we realized that there was a very, very big problem, that everyone was being held to ransom by the last mile, because the postcode system, as good as it was, still wasn't getting people to my front door. Now, I held a dinner party once the furniture was arrived and, uh, arrived and the house was equipped, and I told this story to my friends. And oh boy, it was as if I put a grenade on the table and pulled the pin out. They were all fighting about who had the best story about lack of delivery. And I realized that this was a very, very big problem, that everyone was being held to ransom. And it wasn't only the parcels that were late. It was also the pizzas that were arriving cold, or the Uber driver that couldn't get to you, couldn't find you, was still driving up and down the street, or the sat-navs that couldn't even find the streets because it was a new-build housing estate. And then worst of all, the e-commerce people were being held to ransom by bad ratings. And I hold my hand up that I gave some very bad ratings because I was very fed up at being held to ransom in my own home. So we decided to do something about it. That's Michael. All right, so how big is the problem? In 2016 in the UK, 10 billion pounds was spent in e-commerce. That's about 14 to 15 billion dollars of which 771 million was lost due to bad or incorrect delivery data. Is it the green button? Yeah. Yes. In the US, the problem's a lot bigger, okay? There are over one billion re-delivery attempts uh, at a cost of $15 per delivery attempt. So that's $15 billion that is being impacted on the US economy. But this is the number that really, sorry about that, really strikes me. 62% of the US population, their address isn't at their front door. So. E-commerce is in the fast lane, but the last mile is still slowing everything down. In fact, it's holding a bridge to ransom. But not anymore. 
So what is post tag and how does it work? Post tag is a global solution to the last mile conundrum. How do you get to the right address first time? So in the UK, we have a database that covers every property, whether it be residential or commercial, which we update from seven separate data sources on a daily basis, sometimes hourly. We use our own methodology, uh, we use our own AI um, uh, algorithms to ensure that we always have the most up-to-date and correct data source possible. So when somebody goes onto a, a, an e-commerce site to order something up, whether it be a pair of pants, pants being different in the US to the UK, or a pizza, when they actually input their, 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 their data, their um, address data, we actually intercept that. We intercept that, and then what we do is we compare it against our database. We verify that address and check it, and once we're happy that we've actually got the right address, what we do is we encode the Latin long into three digits, the post tag. We then deliver that post tag to the delivery agent, and that is what enables them to get their drivers to the right front door first time, every time. So there's two things I've been told never to do in presentations. Number one, live demos. And you'll be really glad to hear that we're not going to be doing a live demo. The second thing is an auditorium ask for a show of hands. So hey, let's live dangerously. So who has been held hostage in their own home waiting for a parcel to arrive? At this point, you're supposed to put your hands up. Hey. So you've all been held to ransom. They're lying. They're lying, because there must be more than that. You've been held to ransom in your own home waiting for these parcels to, to arrive. But not anymore. post has solved this problem. At the moment we freed the UK, next is France, not a particularly popular choice, I'll be quite honest, but there we go. Then the rest of the EU, then through the UAE to Australia, and then America will be coming to free you as well. So, we solved a really, really big problem. A world held to ransom by the last mile, and we've done it with three digits. Just give us the money. Nobody gets hurt. Right. Thank you very much indeed for your time. You. Oh, is there one more? There is one more. Hey, look, I never said it before. Man. Something more? No. That's it? No, we're done. Okay, it. please. <laughs> Judges. I, I, I just wanted to clarify one point. You talked about intercepting your address. Yeah. Um, this is all activity taking place. That's because the retailer has signed up with you. Correct. And so when the retailer gets an address, they go into your system, pull out the tag, and then that gets sent down to the driver. So there's no, no one else needs to be concerned about it. Me as the addressee, I don't have to worry about it. That's that, correct. Is that the so it is a frictionless system, Elmer. So what we've done is everybody that goes onto an e-commerce site actually puts their address in. In the UK, what they do is they actually make an API call to one or two data sources to actually check and give that. So you have like a pop-up which says, you know, if you put the postcode in, this is the address. What we do is we intercept that. So as far as the end user is concerned, they don't see anything different. The retailer doesn't have to do anything different. The whole idea behind post tag, it has to be simple. It has to be frictionless. In that way, it works really well. Do you uh, map into any uh, GPS type system or uh, do you own that as well. Okay, great question. So we actually looked very, very close to it at how to make this the easiest way of being possible. And what we looked at is we just provide, in essence, the post tag, which is that and long. How we actually get that to the retailer and why we are completely agnostic when it comes to delivery mechanisms is we actually inject that information at the scheduling level. So it doesn't matter if they're using TomTom, Garmin, Waze, Google, whatever it might be, we're way beyond that. We're sorry, way before that. So what happens is, is the, sh the scheduling actually says this is where the location is, and that's where we interject it. So again, it's really simple to use. There's no friction. So how do you know exactly where the entrance is, where the door that you have to use for delivery is? Okay, so what we do is, part of it is machine learning and AI. So what we do is we actually identify the property through the, 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 the Latin long in the UK. And then what from that one is we actually can uh, work out where the entrance is. It's, what's a polite way of putting it? It's a bit of a fudge. Okay, what we do is we get guys to really, really close to the front door. So when the van comes along and says, you know, the satellite navigation system says, hey, stop, it's that one, it's actually that one. The problem in the UK that we find with the delivery, with deliveries is when the clocks go back and it gets dark, very few people in the UK actually like their house number or name. 
new housing estates are a disaster. It takes up to two years for them to appear on the satellite navigation systems. So what our system actually does is it gives the confidence to the driver actually that is the address that he's got to stop at. So when the system tells him to stop, it's that one. They can just walk up the driveway from that point. Okay. So then how do you compete with, uh, let's say, what three words? I was waiting for that question. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what three words? Great technology, but it's pull. You actually have to leave the e-tailer site to go and create your what three words and then give it back to them. So if the, if the retail or the, the delivery agent isn't using it, they can't really use it. So there's friction there. It stops people. And there's a huge amount of money spent in the industry stopping people abandoning carts. So this is just another way that a cart would be abandoned. Post tag is different. We use a push technology. So what happens is by actually not getting the, the user to do anything different, what we're doing is we're just giving that information back to the retailer. They don't have to leave the site. They don't have to do anything else. So we push the information. My, my what three words are backyards, sheet, prance. I invited 20 people to an all-you-can-drink cocktail party at my place. All they had to do was download the app and get there. 13 people made it. The one that made it with the least phone calls was seven phone calls. Repeat that again. Backyard. Sheets, no, 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 backyards, sheet, prance. How to spell prance? Yeah. So the, the thing is that uh, for a uh, um, walkthrough, it's a great product, you know, and you cannot knock the guys. I mean, they've done us a huge amount of favors by spending $13 million in advertising, which helps us. So you know, we're very, very useful for that. But in terms of a commercial aspect, it's not really there, and you can see that from where they've had a lack of impact and lack of traction. Um, we just looked at it differently. You know? It has to be frictionless. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I see Carla arriving. Hi there. Hello. Odin, please. Hello, everyone. Hello, sharks. <laughs> My name's Carter, and I'm the director of web engineering at a company that I'm excited to share with you today, Odin. At Odin, we work to explore the operational dynamics of our customers' supply chains in order to identify waste, reduce variability, and increase customer service level. And we do it all at a fraction of the cost of our competitors. Odin sits between the operational and strategic goals of your company's supply chain. On the operational side, we help you answer questions like, when will my shipment arrive? And how do I best manage this disruption? due to a port strike or inclement weather. On the strategic side, we help shippers and planners make more informed decisions around things such as what port should they be shipping through? Should they ship today, tomorrow, next week, using this carrier or that? Our metrics allow them to help answer questions like how well is their cross-docking facility performing today? And how well does its performance compare against all other facilities in the area? And, and as well against itself the day before, the week before that, and even a year before that. To help us answer these questions and to achieve cost effectiveness at scale, we've developed a low cost asset tracking solution, which I'll just give to the judges real quick. Thanks. Now, traditional asset trackers that use cellular and GPS functions can cost upwards of $100 per device. Our device uses a patent-pending Wi-Fi-based solution to allow for geolocation and communication at a significantly reduced price point. Currently, our device is between $10 and $15 per unit, and at high scale, we're working to get that down to $5 per device. It also has integrated into it a number of key sensors, including temperature, humidity, motion, and shock sensors. These unit economics allow our customers to map and monitor their entire supply chains. Odin is global. So far, we've tracked shipments in over 20 countries, including the USA, Canada, much of Europe, Saudi Arabia, and China. Just want to point out a couple images I have on this slide here. On the left, we have a pilot customer of ours affixing one of our devices to a shipment going from Germany to France. And on the right, you see heat maps that I put together showing data we've collected over just the past few months from our different pilot programs that we have. By combining the pallet level insights we get from this global network of devices with a network of third party data sets, such as container vessel movement, traffic information, and weather patterns, our customers now have a single platform they go to to make more informed shipping decisions. 
our web platform spans this range between micro level visibility, which will cover a single shipment, and macro level visibility, which covers their entire supply chain. So at its most granular, all the way here on the micro side, we have specific shipment visibility to allow our customers to see where their shipment has been, where it is currently, and where it's going. Through ERP integrations and bill of lading uploads, our customers are have, able to have their SKUs matched up with their shipments so they understand what goods and what value of goods are moving where and when. Our predictive engine continuously updates estimated times of arrival, notifying the key stakeholders when key events are about to take place, like some disruptions going on or you know, the, the uh, estimated time of arrival has been updated. Moving further towards this macro level visibility, we also offer optimized route selection in, in order to try and reduce in-transit days. A pilot customer of ours was able to identify nine days of in-transit savings through the use of Mediterranean ports that we uncovered as being viable options through our fleet platform. All the way on the micro side, or macro side, excuse me, we also offer full supply network analysis. As our devices are shipped throughout our customer supply chains, we're starting to build up this virtual value stream and this supply chain map this actually image here is information and points of interest that we automatically built up from one of our pilot programs with one of our customers. And this information allows us to start to track metrics against key internal points of interest, like distribution centers and manufacturing facilities, but also gives our customers additional insight into third party and external points of interest, like customer retail locations and ports. This holistic view allows these different tiers of the supply chain to stay in better sync with one, one another and to be more responsive to each other's needs. We've seen on our platform manufacturers and customer retail locations, these different businesses, these different companies coming together to communicate and collaborate and have a discussion around expectations and performance all through the Odin fleet platform. As the wealth of information we collect from our network of devices, as well as this third party data sets continues to grow, so too will our capabilities as a company. Thank you. who starts? I think I have a quick question. I think just to, uh, so that I'm sure that I understand the technology, mm -hmm. I think if you talk about the single shipment or the micro tracking, yeah. you use a nesting, uh, you use the GPS of the truck to assume that the shipment is in the truck so I know where it is? No, so that's actually kind of the interesting thing. So when it's on land, we're using our device like I passed around. But once it goes on a container vessel, at that point, we start to use AIS. So now we use this global positioning container vessel movement platform to understand where that vessel is moving uh, in the water. So from the customer perspective, they go to our platform and they kind of have this consistent experience around tracking that shipment. Under the hood, we're just swapping out the technologies we're using because obviously once it's on that container, our Wi-Fi based solution is not going to work. So we use whatever we need uh, in order to get that tracking for our customers. So that's along the same question I had in the technology. Uh, when you say Wi-Fi based, it's actually transmitting uh, as well, not not picking up and relying on other networks? That's correct. So it, we use it for geolocation and communication to offload the information that it's gathering. And you know, obviously, we can only offload on unencrypted networks. Uh, but from private encrypted networks, we're still picking up that location information. Once it hits, say, a distribution center or manufacturing facility, at that point, when they have those unencrypted networks, uh, it's offloading that data back to our servers so that we have kind of that full history that kind of gets filled in once we get that information. Okay, because okay, I was kind of thinking for shipments to households and things like that, mm -hmm. it would need to find an unencrypted network in order to transfer That's right, and so data. we've partnered with iPass to build up you know, one of the world's largest networks of open access points in the world. So if you see Xfinity hotspots, any of those, we can offload our data on those. Um, and we've seen, you know, just from the, the pilot programs we've done, uh, pretty high and, and pretty good visibility, especially within cities, about being able to actually offload and get consistent tracking. Got a question on your predictive analysis tool. Yeah. What kind of data do you use and where do they come from? Sure. So, you know, as I mentioned, one is just our device. How well is that device moving within our customer supply chain? And then we have a pretty awesome data team that starts to build up these points of interest and track things like dwell time, things like lead time. How well are these points of interest performing? How long does it take goods to go from manufacturing all the way to that customer retail location? So again, that's for our specific device. 
but also, as I mentioned, container vessel movement, uh, that's a third party uh, data source that we're using and starting to now integrate with weather information to start to detect those anomalies and take corrective action there, as well as, you know, we've had interest from customers around uh, traffic information so they can start to dynamically reroute as they see and as we uh, understand that, you know, there's going to be a problem. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, sorry to talk about competition again. Oh, it's fine. Uh, yeah. But the, the, the cloud supply chain management market is quite competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, even big corporation now, like SAP, Oracle, offer mm -hmm. a cloud-based solution for asset tracking, predictive yeah. maintenance, route optimization. How do you differentiate? Is that this IoT stuff specifically? So I think or? that's a part of it. And for us, you know, we are, see ourselves as a data, a data aggregator. You know, I think everything we've heard so far is just proof that the information that companies are collecting is that power, is that knowledge. So we would be integrating with those additional data sources. And again, our goal is to be this de facto platform that customers will use because we have integrated all those other pieces of information into the platform. Um, so that's where we are trying to position ourselves. You know, having this asset tracking device that's really low cost is one way to just get our foot in the door, get our own sort of proprietary data. But at that point, you know, if someone had already created this device, we would just use that information and have it within our, our kind of holistic platform. Do you, do you expect that to be returned to you, or once you've sold it, you've sold it? So, so it is uh, reusable if our customers want, and we definitely encourage them to uh, reuse that that device as much as much as they can. Uh, but you know, at that price point, it, it can be disposed of. Uh, but for us, it's more of a SaaS play. So it's less about the device and more about us providing this software as a service to these different businesses. One of the things that you talked about is offloading the data onto an unencrypted network. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us have scanners uh, that ha that uh, basically have that accessibility. Could it offload to the scanner that the driver already uh, has with them in order to pass that data along? Yeah, so it absolutely would. One of the most surprising things we've seen is, you know, I don't know if you've, you know, Many of these large buses now are connected with Wi-Fi. We've actually seen our devices offload their location information when they're passing by these internet-connected buses. And so we'll see, you know, device offloaded on megabus. So for us, you know, that's kind of the aha moment that, you know, Wi-Fi really is ubiquitous and there's all these different ways that we're able to get our information uh, back in ways that, you know, we didn't even really expect. And so, yeah, e even if it's the, the driver's device, yeah, that would work for us. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next one in line is Udelf. Uh, Adriel, please. Do you need the clicker? Yeah, it should be there, I guess. I've got no mic. All right, this should be fine. The postal industry is one of the most innovative in history because your innovation can be measured in minutes and seconds and in dollars and cents. So I want to talk about how the, the Udell Autonomous Vehicle, a self-driving car built specifically for deliveries, can help cut the cost of last mile delivery in half and help prepare the postal industry for the coming growth and demand brought on by e-commerce. Looking back at some of your past innovations, in the US, the Pony Express was huge because it brought logistics and reliability to a business that was previously very fragmented and very local. Later on, Ben's Franklin's ponies were replaced with cars, and innovations became all about volume and convenience. But this is really not enough to match the growth that's going to come because of e-commerce. As e-commerce threatens to triple in the next 10 years, imagine all of your business today doing three times the number of deliveries just 10 years from now. Your CFOs are probably pumped. The operations people in you uh, might be questioning how that's going to happen. And so you can't do that with just more cars, and you can't do that for a number of reasons. Cars and trucks are already a huge climate pollution issue, and that's just simply unsustainable as they clog more roads. They are also a huge cause of fatalities. 40,000 deaths a year in the United States, 1.3 million across the world due to car-related deaths, many of those miles being driven by uh, vehicles and, and delivery fleets that drive those miles. 
And that tragic number doesn't even account for actually all the maintenance and repair costs that comes from repairing a fleet of hundreds of thousands of vehicles that are constantly getting into accidents and bumps that can be avoided with autonomous driving. And lastly, e-commerce has brought a certain demand for convenience to the customer that just never really existed before and that again, more trucks can't solve. This requires innovation that starts with software and is brought in across the entire platform. So where is this going to come from? Well, if we started with horses and we made our way to carriages and then clearly horseless carriages, well, the answer is going to be in driverless carriages. You have created the world's first public road autonomous vehicle and it's been live since launching on January 30th. And it's going to be able to tackle many of these issues that past innovations has had and also solve many new ones. Look at things like logistics. By constantly being able to track vehicles and create small delivery windows, you can improve that. By minimizing the number of accidents you have and hiring fewer drivers, you can reinvest in becoming a consistently more reliable experience to the customer, like all that's been talked about today. And volume and customer experience is something that's at the core of what we've done with our very, very first model and something we're focused on continuing to develop as autonomous technology grows. Now, all this is, in theory, really awesome. Self-driving cars are here. They're going to save everyone's problems, and we'll all go home happy. But the question is, for operations folks like yourself, when is this actually going to come into effect? This is a photo from our launch on January 30th, two months ago. You can see the driver's got his hands off the wheel, the car's in full autonomy. And that's really cool. That's half of what we do. The other half is the actual delivery experience. Over the last two months, we've done over 100 deliveries carrying things like groceries and flowers and food. And from each and every delivery, we learn things that, of course, you, with your million deliveries a day, have been learning for many years. But an autonomous vehicle needs to learn for the first time because this is happening very differently than it happens in your industries. Autonomous vehicles are going to be here very soon. And this is a photo that we love showing what we call, sorry to my friends at FedEx over there, the past and future of delivery. No matter how autonomous vehicles get implemented into your fleets, whether they're following the postman around, if they're a totally new model of a locker that's mobile and going to highly dense populations, or some sort of hybrid, they're going to be able to create that enormous uh, cost cutting that you need to be able to grow with e-commerce and to be able to uh, allow you to supply deliveries in this growing world. So in the spirit of Postal Vision, uh, with the theme of daring to be bold, sharing technologies across the world, and caring about customer-centric solutions first, UDEV is excited to be partnering with the postal industry to reinvent deliveries. Thanks. Bernardo, help me answer questions. Of course. <laughs> Go ahead. So, as far as I understand, at the moment you are running a, a kind of pilot, right, from uh, January this year. So, what is your mid-term market entry strategy, also partnership strategy, for instance, with the postal organizations? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I'll split that up in two ways. For our first month we launched, it was amazing. We got coverage from everyone you can imagine from all over the world, and everybody was calling us, major retailers, European postal organizations. We were on top of the world, we were going to take over. And then we realized those are very long sales cycles. And we don't want to sit around waiting to be doing something for many months. So uh, I did what I've done at previous companies I founded, which is walk around store to store to store and ask people their problems. So in the short term, we're working with local businesses, which is an amazing opportunity to see things on the ground. It's an amazing opportunity to do deliveries. Every single one of them is paid. So we're supporting and paid at a price that we think we can get to in the future when autonomy at scale. At Later stage, in terms of partnerships, uh, our goal in the short term is to do volume, to understand what the customer experience is going to be like uh, in terms of doing deliveries. And so that could be uh, one year long pilots like we're discussing with some major retailers or purchasing a small fleet of cars to be experimenting in multiple geographies. Because at the moment it's a lot about learning, experimenting, but at one moment you will need to, you will need scalability. Huh? Absolutely. And he, there's two ways to do that. One is to wait until the moment where you need scalability and you know everyone realizes, hey, autonomous vehicles are here, let's start. And the other is to say, let's learn over the next year so that in one year from now when we're ready to scale, we already have hundreds of thousands of deliveries worth of data points. Just to be clear, the, the model you have is that you want to be the delivery agent as well or is it selling vehicles? We don't want to be in your business. Right, okay, so it's selling vehicles. It's selling vehicles. Right. It's selling vehicles or selling space on the vehicles. 
well, depending I, on the I business. just didn't understand why you, you said you went around talking to local retailers. What for if you're selling a vehicle? Because selling a vehicle to you will take many, many months. Getting paid per delivery by local retailers will teach us so much about how a delivery actually happens that we can then bring it. That's what we're doing. We're, that's not our model. That's our education model in order to get to be able to be serving your business well. So uh, right now, we, we all understand the autonomous vehicle. Uh, however, uh, you have a driver in it today. What do you f see as what I call the uh, vehicle um, uh, essentially movement system. How are you going to get the parcel to the to the end customer off of the off of the vehicle when there is when it is truly unmanned? Yeah, amazing question because obviously it's that's the whole point is you can get something to the door and or you can get something to the curb and then how to get to the door. Um, we could have a very long discussion about that. So to keep it short, a couple answers. One, many times we're actually finding customers don't mind coming to the curb. If they know when the order is coming which is something we're very focused on providing. They say they can track the car. They know when it's seven minutes away, five minutes away, outside. If they know when it's coming and it's con at a time that's convenient for them, 80% of our customers come to the door, come to the car, no problem. Besides that, we got lots of ideas and that's what the education is about. You'll hear later from Motogo. They have an idea about how to get it from the car to the door. Um, there's other versions like the USPS report where it says there's actually a driver there, not driving the car, but doing other menial tasks, maybe doing data entry, sorting through the mail, figuring out what happens at the next stop, and then the human is actually the one that delivers it. Tons of versions, but the answer is we're starting to figure that out right now, and we're learning that the actual customer might be a bigger part of that than we thought. And have you figured out how to load the van? That's, that's actually why we walked around to local retailers, uh, and that's been one of our big learnings. So we have a merchant app um, that can either be you know, directly to Susie's Flower Shop, or it can work with uh, a post office. So all the orders are in there. They get entered automatically. You just click an order, load it, click an order, load it. And we're working on making that simpler over time. Sorry. What, what is your core, your core value, your core business? You're building the vehicles, the uh, autonomous technology inside? Or why won't you benefit from others' technology? Absolutely. Uh, we're right now bringing things, we're bridging things together, right? Um, we don't know how to build 50,000 vehicles. That's a fact. That should not be our job. We don't know maybe um, uh, the full battery technology, but we're building that right now as well. What our core is and what we're going to grow into as the environment grows around us is to be doing what we call the last 100 feet of autonomy, meaning general autonomy, going down the street, stopping at a red light, and making a right turn. That's not as complicated as you might imagine. There's tons of people who do that. It's that last parking scenario, that how do you navigate a, a parking lot, that how do you parallel park. That's what we're focused on. That and the actual loading and unloading experience. So, so manufacturing vehicles is quite an asset-intensive business. Yeah. How have you been financed your developments and the pilot so far? Yeah, so we're, we're well capitalized. Um, we, we like to say that we're, we have enough money to not run out, but not enough that we're going to get snotty about it. Uh, so we have the capital to be able to manufacture vehicles. In vehicle manufacturing, which uh, there's probably folks from DHL here, you guys probably know well, when you do 1, 10, 20, very expensive. The minute you start going to the hundreds and thousands, your cost drops so dramatically that it makes the case much easier. So right now we manufacture one at a time, and it's pricey. Uh, but once you start hitting just 100 vehicles a year, which our goal is to do that next year, right now we want to do 25 this year, uh, it gets considerably cheaper and drop that cost a lot. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> you mentioned Motogo. David, you're the next. In this new world of online shopping and last mile delivery, do you know anyone who's been stressed out with questions like, where is the package? Do I need to be home to get it? Who took it? I'm David Ruth from Motogo, and we have a new solution for last mile delivery 
to lower the stress and bring back the smiles. Let me tell you about our own secure transport container, which is the basis of our delivery solution by answering some questions. Where is the package? You will know because we use ILT communications for precision tracking. Even better, we'll let you know when it will arrive using AI predictive logistics. You do not need to be home because the transport container will be physically locked to an anchor point when it's delivered to your home. What about security? Will it still be there? Yes, the anchored intelligent container keeps watch and is able to report problems. This is how it works. The smart container is locked to a physical anchor point. The items to be shipped are placed into the container. The cover is closed and locked. The shipping information is electronically downloaded into the container and the delivery vehicle is requested. In this uh, example, the delivery vehicle arrives, the smart container is loaded onto the truck and it's off to its destination. The vehicle has arrived and it's located the anchor point. To complete the delivery, the container is locked to the anchor point. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, the package is secured and being monitored for uh, security. And the vehicle is off to uh, do its next delivery or pickup. Now the customer arrives and uses his phone to access the container. The container is unlocked and the customer removes the contents. Now the container is free to ship something else or to be retrieved. Note that the anchor point could be located somewhere else upon the property with either a human, a drone, or robot making the delivery to that location. Why use a standardized anchor point interface? With each delivery component using the interface, the container is physically secured during each segment of its journey. To achieve our vision, we partner with providers of technology such as robotics and self-driving vehicles. These will be combined with our own hardware and software to create the package delivery system. This allows us to shorten our design time and use, utilize world-class technologies. Our CTO, Leonard Lell, and I have been leaders in the creation and delivery of many leading-edge technologies during the last 30 years, with a combined product revenue of greater than $50 billion. We know how to create uh, products which can be used throughout the world. Our components can be added to the delivery systems of today to offer significant benefits such as tracking and security. But we really kick in to enable the future of delivery by creating the pieces necessary for a fully automated delivery system. And yes, we're also environmentally green. By using the MotoGo system, the customer will feel confident in knowing where the package is, when it will arrive, and especially that it is secured. Thank you for allowing me to share our vision, and I look forward to your questions. Could you tell me about the container? Is that a one-use time container that uh, secures the lock to the uh, just secures a package to the lock, or is that uh, no, something that's... No, it's, it's a reusable, um, so that's the advantage of the container. It can be reused uh, thousands of times. Uh, every time you um, uh, initiate a shipment, the shipping information is downloaded into it. Uh, 
but how do you retrieve the container after I take the I take my package out of the container? You now have the container at the, at the uh, destination. Uh, what's the what's the plan of the cycle for that? Okay, so um, as these things get into uh, full commercial use, and you can basically uh, the the delivery vehicles will be going through continuous routes through the neighborhoods. And so as a, when it makes the delivery, it can pick up uh, the, the ones that are already uh, consumed. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. And also because it, it addressed some problems linked to autonomous delivery. I mean, the, the, the really last mile with autonomous delivery it allows it to be easier. Um, my question is about costs. So I, if, of course, the container can be reusable, it quite kind of responds to the question that it is costly but reusable. What about the anchor point, the infrastructure? Do you need a lot of technology on it? Is it costly or? So the anchor point in infrastructure is similar to like a utility that you install one time. Um, and, you know, just like any other utility, like a cable TV or whatever. So I suspect the cost for uh, the physical part of it to be, you know, less than $50, but then there's the manpower to go out and uh, install it. Talking about the anchor points, uh, are they in public space, private space? I'm sorry, I didn't. These anchor points. Yes. Are they in public space or, or private space? Oh, public space or private space? Yes. Um, the intention is to open source the interface uh, and establish a standard that can be employed by uh, mobile carriers. Yeah, but is is that your question? No, my, my oh, question was the infrastructure. Oh. Is it located in public uh, space, like in cities, on the street, public streets? Okay, so. Or is it more uh, in there private? There would be multiple um, uses of it. Uh, like street side, like uh, street side mailboxes, uh, the anchor points could be located there, it could be located up by your house, uh, by the front door. There's also the notion of, uh, of anchor point clusters. And within, you know, apartments or condos could have anchor point clusters also. How far have you gotten? Are you just at the point of having an idea, or have you prototyped something, or? Um, we're a very early stage company, and I wanted to get this idea and vision out to uh, the public. Uh, you know, we've uh, spent most of our time in high level architecture and design and uh, submitting a number of intellectual property uh, coverage. Uh, we have our first patent. Um, so we are early stage, less than 10 people, and we're progressing to uh, do our first uh, proof of uh, concept uh, trial. And the proof of concept would be just the box and the anchor point, not the delivery vehicle. That's, that's not what you're working on, right? Well, we're actually working with uh, an autonomous vehicle, um, a, pr a provider of an autonomous vehicle to demonstrate uh, the, the capability of automated delivery. And then that patent that you have, is that a design patent or is that a utility patent? It's a utility patent. Just one last one. Uh, the, the anchoring system uh, that you have uh, planned, uh, what technology are you using to anchor the, uh, the package to the, to the anchor itself? Well, it's a mechanical, um, electronic mechanical uh, with the actuator. Um, so we're working through you know, what works best uh, with the uh, capabilities to uh, for robotics. And, and um, so we're, we're trying out variations. There's many variations that we're exploring. No more questions? Then thank you very much, David. So the last uh, company that's going to speech, uh, pitch, <laughs>
that's package AI. And Ralph, here he's coming. What an amazing group of uh, presenters. So my name is Ralph Schulberg. I'm the VP of Sales for Package AI, uh, first choice and last mile logistics automation. Uh, we have a, a problem. We have several problems in, uh, in last mile uh, delivery, but the problem that we're focused on is mismanaged customer expectations. Uh, the way you have it now is you have customers waiting uh, long times for packages, three, four hour windows and so forth, uh, and you have failed deliveries. And what this does is this creates tremendous, uh, tremendous frustration in customers and increased cost of re-delivery attempts and manpower to, to do so. So we're trying to uh, alleviate, alleviate that. A quick story about this. Um, I was at the Apple store on break. I went to get a case. Uh, the gentleman uh, sales rep saw my tag. And he's like, well, what's, what are you here for? I explained about the whole conference. And he's like, I'm waiting for a package today from FedEx. I'm here at work, and I wish I could tell FedEx what to do, uh, where to drop it, and communicate better. So. And that was just the first customer, uh, first person I spoke to and got instant, instant response. Uh, the solution is a customer-centric uh, delivery management platform powered by Jenny, uh, which is an AI platform. Uh, what Jenny does, she does end-user scheduling where she will uh, talk with customers, she will negotiate the time. If the customer is uh, available that time, they'll go ahead and lock in that delivery date. If the customer is not available, they will, uh, she will renegotiate a time, whether it's tomorrow, later in the day, or sometime in the future, and reschedule uh, properly. Uh, on top of that, uh, Jenny will uh, dispatch and route optimize. She will take into consideration traffic stops and location and plan the best route to communicate. Once she has the route set up, she will automatically dispatch the driver. The driver will get a, a message to the phone, will have a full route of every stop that they have. Uh, once they, uh, they'll have an app on their phone, once they click start the route, uh, the first customer is notified and the customer is able to uh, take, a, take a look and see the status as to where the, where, the, where the driver is and be able to communicate with the driver back and forth. So we have our, our route optimization notifies the driver and it sends uh, updates to the customer every step of the way. If there's uh, an issue, the customer is able to uh, tell the driver to leave it at the neighbor, at the back door, or wherever to make it more convenient. Uh, and then the beauty of the software is post-delivery engagement. Uh, yesterday we were, uh, we were also speaking at the um, post office event and everybody was talking about lifetime value and how to make the customer happy. And uh, what this does is once the package is delivered, uh, the customer gets an immediate reminder and asks them how was your delivery experience. And if the delivery experience is good, the customer will turn around and say, uh, it's, a it's, a, it's a five, it was a good experience, it will prompt you for a review. If it was a bad experience, it will prompt it to a live agent and will be able to resolve that issue right then and there, uh, saving valuable uh, time and headache on negative feedback and trying to remove that. Uh, let's look at the solution up close. So I had mentioned uh, pre-delivery, we'll negotiate, we'll, we'll explain to the customer when, uh, when the route is expected, when the package is expected, and it'll, it'll say uh, yes or if no, it'll give three choices and all the customer has to do is simply respond back A, B, or C, and that'll take care of the next step. Uh, when the package is on the way, it gives updates uh, about an hour away, uh, 15 minutes away, so it takes that two, three hour window and it'll bring it down to 15 minutes and get uh, notifications. And again, at any point through that time, you're able to communicate back to the driver or to, uh, to dispatch and, and convey the message properly. And then I just mentioned the follow-up as well. So let's talk about the tech real quick. It's an artificial intelligence powered, data-driven, real-time optimization, uh, and it's focused on, on customer interaction and customer satisfaction. So we discussed a little bit about fleets, how it'll help manage the delivery system. We, man we explained how uh, it, it interacts with the drivers and how the driver will be able to plan out the day and capture signatures. Uh, and then now let's talk about uh, a Jenny. Jenny a, has a predictive engine and real-time cost pricing engine that goes with the negotiations. So it takes everything in real time and calculates the correct answers and the correct response, taking the human element out, out of it, getting the right answer and the right response. It also uh, has conversational and language understanding, so it can feel like you're talking to a human back and forth, and it builds a profile on the recipient, so as the customer 
uh, use this service again and again, you're able to understand that it's uh, this type of customer with certain types of, uh, of requirements. And what this does with, uh, with the fleets, we can get an increase of 30% uh, fleet utilization while getting customer satisfaction about 10% uh, just for starters increased. And let's talk about the results here. So we can drive significant uh, value proven with early customers. So we're able to cut labor costs by uh, eliminating the need for customer calls, follow-ups the day before, the morning before. So you can have a reduction uh, in that amount of time. You'll improve efficiency by reducing missed, uh, missed deliveries, by uh, calculating the better routes, and you'll be able to increase sales. You're able to at least get a response rate of 25% increase on, on Google. I'm um, sorry, uh, feedback response rate of 25% and Google rating increase of uh, 40%. Thank you. Uh, let me know where this is today. Have you deployed it? Uh, where, where, sure. What we went live towards the, um, toward the end of last year, so we have about uh, six customers live right now in Israel and Australia, in Canada, and in um, and, uh, New Zealand. And the verticals that we're uh, operating now are furniture delivery, some food delivery companies, and some couriers. And we're just getting, uh, getting everybody's feedback, and then we're able to tailor the solution based on individual vertical customers and then as well as postal delivery service. So as we're collecting more data and talking to more people, we're able to tailor make the, the solution to each, each uh, vertical. So the business model is what? How do you make money? So the business model is uh, when you're dealing with a, um, a medium-sized business, it's either a per vehicle, we're able to charge a subscription per vehicle, or on larger, uh, we're able to do a, per, a volume based. So we have two different models depending on the customer. So, so which one is it? Are you after that furniture delivery guy as your customer, or are you trying to sign on USPS? Uh, both, obviously. But again, like mentioned but earlier, the sales cycle to get USPS is, it'll take about a year. At the same time, we need to generate revenues and get the ball rolling. So we're doing a dual approach. Obviously, we want to do the low-hanging fruit of the mid-sized customers while beginning the conversation and seeing how we can do long-term integration while making our, our product known to the public. So we're taking a dual approach on, on that. How many languages does Jenny speak? As many as you need her to. But how many have you trained it to so, so far? So we have uh, about six languages currently, okay. and it's just a matter of getting the developer team to light up, uh, light up the other languages. But Jenny is a very purpose-built chatbot. It can only talk about my delivery issues, right? We can program her to talk about uh, additional. You can, do, you can build right. airplanes she can be, too, but right. uh, for now, the product that you have, Jenny, Knows it, how to talk about deliveries. Correct, and right at this particular so conversation. So then why would, for example, USPS partner with you as opposed to a chatbot that can talk to their customers about other issues too? Why would they get one chatbot that uh, so just talks about deliveries, one chatbot that able, talks about other We're things? able to expand that, but for a viable product that's ready to go to market now, so we're focusing on this, and as we build traction and get the response rate correct, we're able to expand the other phases of, of Jenny. So we're going to market with a ready product that we can uh, put our names behind, and then as that grows, we're able to expand the services. But we don't want to, you wait too long, you develop all the services and it'll take you three years to get to market or we can do one thing really well, get to market now and then develop that as we go. So yes, I agree with you, but it's, it's, a, it's a process. And then Jenny does two things. Jenny is a chatbot and also does dynamic routing, correct? Correct, dynamic routing and di Jenny can also do uh, dynamic pricing structure. So let's say uh, the post office would need to uh, make, a, make an emergency stop depending, you can calculate the, the size, the weight, the time. So you're also take that data if you have any add-ons and it'll be able to recalculate and get uh, pricing and, and um, n n uh, pick up and drop off. So you're able to take that dynamic engine, do pricing and routing and prioritize as well. Um, do you have ambitions to sign on European postal companies? Yes, so the beauty of software as a service is that we're able to uh, to go internationally, globally, and be able to work with multiple agencies across multiple time zones. And did you do the research on what's already out there? So you have a lot of companies that are focused on route optimization. Everybody wants to be able to uh, make sure the route is correct and make sure that the drivers are, uh, are on time. And so that route optimization is not something we're claiming to you know, invent, but we were taking that route optimization and putting that customer uh, in control by putting the, the chatbot in there and taking that chatbot and merging it into a complete software together. Right, okay, because from a interface standpoint or a customer experience, user experience standpoint, I 
struggle to find what uh, you offer that we don't already have, because this, yeah, this is what we do. Uh, so, as as mentioned, we're coming to market with the uh, early stage level of service, and then as we integrate with larger companies, we'll be able to expand on additional services while we're coming to market. And not every not every company out there is, uh, you know, uh, PostNL or the USPS. There's a thousand million of other companies that uh, require this service that don't have the resources to to put back there. So if we're able to get 90% uh, of the customer base, but 10% we're not able to target, uh, I wish we'd be able to do business together. But if that's not the case, then we're able to target other, other companies as well. You experimented so far an increase in customer satisfaction of 10%. How did you monitor this? I'm sorry? You experimented so far an increase in so customer satisfaction of 10%. This is what you show got on it. How one did we of your slides. So How did you monitor So we use our case study. There's an Australian customer, a uh, furniture delivery customer that, uh, that we used, and we monitored their activity very closely to see where they were before, once we implemented the trial, what kind of response rate we had uh, shortly after. So we were able to work that with a particular customer uh, based out of Australia. So that's based on a customer, customer information, not out of thin air. Good. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thank you very much. So, as I said, one was missing, so we had eight, uh, eight startups that were pitching. Uh, the process continues now, of course. I'll give you a very uh, brief overview of what's happening now. I'm going to sit together with the judges. Uh, we take some time out, and uh, we have a look at uh, all the ratings that they have done. We are going to discuss uh, the, the different uh, companies that we have just heard uh, their solutions. And, um, and uh, then we come up, or they, I mean they are the judges, so they come up uh, with the winner. And uh, the reception starts now at 5 o'clock and uh, I think we'll need about maybe 20 to 30 minutes to do that. So during the reception, don't go away, really, stay here, come to the reception and during the reception we will announce the winner, so in about half an hour that should be the case. And, uh, and there is an award, which was standing here the whole time. Maybe you have realized or seen it. Um, and this award will be handed over, but there will be a few other things, of course, as well. There is no money for the winning startup. <laughs> but what we figured out is, uh, is that it's much more important for a startup, actually, to get in contact with the post, to discuss with the post, to give publicity. So there will be publications. There will be a newsletter that will be sent out to about 2,000 stakeholders. Things like that will present all the startups and uh, certainly uh, very specially also the winner, of course. So there will be different kinds of activities around that, uh, which I think is, is much more important because what we have heard here today, again, is I think for everybody here in the room, it's always something new where we say, okay, that, that's a cool solution. That's something I didn't know about. There's really a need and, uh, and suddenly I see something popping up there that's interesting. That's exactly the idea of the whole, of the whole event. <laughs>